I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid, in, in other words, that everything is okay. There are troubles here. We see companies that are warning. We see companies like McDonald's saying that people can't afford to even eat at McDonald's anymore. The Dollar General store is having trouble. Um, so again, to me, it looks like a bifurcated economy here in the U.S. You have anyone that makes, let's say, under 60, 70,000 is really struggling. So if you're looking mid to long term, there's a massive amount of upside still in gold. I remain very, very bullish. We just hit, though, my next target price, which was 2,600. I want to show you how I came up with that price. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and, of course, your host for this channel. Really appreciate you tuning in. We're bringing back Gareth Soloway. I couldn't believe it, but it's been eight months since we had Gareth on the channel and it's time for a reality check because Gareth is our master trader, master chartist here on Soar Financially and uh, we really need to figure out uh, where, where are things headed. Um, reality check that's what i mean like we talk a lot of theory doom and gloom sadly on this channel but uh, how how real is it and how real is it going to get according to the charts and uh, really looking forward to speaking with gareth here in a few short seconds but before i switch over to my guest kindly hit that like and subscribe button we really appreciate it, it helps us out a lot and uh, it helps us educate more investors and uh, yeah just spread the message so really appreciate that now without much further ado gareth it's great to welcome you back on the program it's good to see you again oh good to see you and so so good to be back on the program as well it's been way too long. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I was doing my research when we last chatted in eight months. So yeah. much has happened in the last eight months. And uh, I think, but it's also a good time to re to uh, review some of your calls as well and see where we're headed, of course. But uh, let, let's start on the macro side. Let's start main markets first. We've seen Fed rate cuts, uh, Chinese stimulus package announced this week, massive impact on the market. Um, let, let's take a look at the broader markets and get your opinion on uh, how, how's the, how are these two items um, sort of affecting the main markets here? Yeah, so so the broader market continues to be strong, and we've seen that. We saw the 50 basis point rate cut by the Fed just last week. Um, that triggered initially a sell-off, which I think was so fascinating. Um, one of the things I've been harping on recently is this, this narrative push by what appears to be the bigger institutions to try to keep people bullish and putting money in the markets. And so we saw that 50 basis point rate cut last Wednesday. The market sold off and actually ended negative on the day. And then once we got to the nighttime, there was this media push to say that, wow, 50 basis point rate cut, this means there's no chance of a recession. And that narrative then spread throughout the internet, throughout the world, and it created a big rally the next day. So these type of things I pay close attention to because it actually makes me very nervous. Why are they so intently pushing the market or trying to keep the bulls bullish? Um, and we'll have to see where it goes. But to me, again, it's institutional money that generally is not exiting or has not exited their positions and they have to keep people in the market and putting more money in the market so they have that extra liquidity. Yeah, it's like I've noticed something very similar, but I've noticed terms like prolonged downturn and soft landing pop up. Like when you say recession, I often think like hard landing, is this going to be a, a, a bad scenario? But the language has changed and I've discussed that with somebody else on the channel recently. It's It seems like they're feeding or drip feeding us negative news without really being negative. Yep. But a 50 basis point cut is probably the first signal and a red flag that something is amiss here. And, uh, and yeah, and I was going to say, I mean, that's that's the biggest cue to me as a, as a technical trader that's been doing this now for 25 years. You know, if, if you believe that the economy is going to have a soft landing or no landing at all and that inflation, remember, at least here in the U.S., is still close to three percent, maybe just under three percent, but certainly not at the two percent mandate that they always talked about then why is the need to cut 50 basis points there? Why not just do 25 and then 25 and kind of take your time? This shows to me that they are more nervous about the labor market than they're letting on, but the markets and investors are very willing to believe whatever the Fed says and that everything's going to be fine. And the, the media is also spewing that as well. I mean, the media, again, uh, just after that Fed rate cut, uh, I heard all this talk about how Jerome Powell engineered this perfect landing. It was like a, a 10 out of 10. And I'm just in my head, I'm like, Man, it's never that easy. Something's up here. Yeah, from from what I heard and I rewatched the press conference, I think Jerome Powell, if he could go back to July, he'd cut twenty five basis points then mm -hmm. and now. Like I think the fifty yeah. was more of an overreaction that he didn't cut in July, and we've seen revised job numbers and, as you said, unemployment. I think he yeah. sounded quite nervous actually. Just you know, my uneducated reading of his body language and uh, tone that he used during the press conference just indicated that he's quite nervous. And the four point four percent as a target they gave out. 
doesn't seem realistic. I think we'll overshoot that by 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 a long stretch of by by quite a bit. And yeah. uh, if I look, I looked at Fed Watch uh, earlier, the CME tool here, what what the market sort of predicts, and fifty basis point cut at the next meeting in about forty three days. Right? That's yeah. that that's hefty. And and to me again, if that's what we get, that doesn't tell me that it's a soft landing or no landing at all. That does not say that at all. It seems extremely rapid. Like the, the cutting, right? So it seems like we're trying to counterbalance something that's already in motion that we can't stop, right? Right, that's... and I think it, what it tells us is the Fed thinks that they might have gone too long. Like you're saying, maybe they should have cut in July, then then made, made it more kind of a gentle ease, but now they're playing catch up. And again, what does that tell us about the economy? I mean, remember the Fed sees information that we don't see. They see trends that we don't see. They talk to people we don't talk to. And so they definitely are privy to information. And that's why it's so intriguing to watch kind of the narrative stay relatively bullish while we're seeing such obvious signs that there are things that are quite working well in the economy. Yeah, let's, let's take a look at the charts, because one, one thing that puzzled me, quite frankly, is that the market hadn't priced in 50 basis points, and the market keeps continuing to go up, um, S&P 500, but also gold. Um, yeah. Gold has other factors weighing on it as well, or helping it pull higher. But uh, I was surprised because I figured, okay, that's priced in. Market expected rate cuts, maybe not 50, but 25 for sure. And if I look at the, I, I think I looked at the Fed watch tool again, just a day before the Fed rate cut, and it was 50-50. Mm -hmm. So some market participants definitely priced in 50 percent, uh, a 50 basis a basis point cut at that time. And I'm su I'm still surprised that it happened. So let, let's pull up the chart here. Let, let's bring that up here. But I'm curious uh, what, what it tells us. Yeah, so this is the S&P 500. And what we can see here is that we are basically hovering right at all time highs. And what I'm really following here is a couple things. So, so this was the Thursday right here where we had that big rally following the Wednesday rate cut that actually did see the market sell off. So you could see that there were participants that when the 50 basis point rate cut occurred, they were a little nervous. They're like, why is the Fed doing this? But then the next day, that narrative totally switched to, hey, everything's perfect. There's no chance of a recession and the market's ripped up. Now, what I'm watching here is this high right here. We have the high from last Thursday. And so far, we've been kind of hammering on it, but we haven't had a daily close above. If they successfully close us above that level, I do think that they could push us to, to 6,000 on the S&P 500. Um, just because it's a major round number, it would get people uber bullish uh, in terms of, wow, look at that even number on the S&P 500. We're now at 6,000. But again, for me, I'm net bearish. I'm net short the market. I continue to not be a believer. I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid, in, in other words that everything is okay. There are troubles here. We see companies that are warning. We see companies like McDonald's saying that people can't afford to even eat at McDonald's anymore. The Dollar General store is having trouble. Um, so again, to me, it looks like a bifurcated economy here in the US. You have anyone that makes, let's say, under 60, 70,000 is really struggling. They don't have a lot of investment, so they're not participating in the stock market at all time highs. They're really struggling because they got crushed on inflation. Then you have the other side of the economy, which is people that are in the stock market that, yeah, inflation's been a bummer, but they're still doing really, really well. And so the question is, as long as the stock market does well, I think the economy here holds up relatively well. But if this stock market ever kind of stops going up, that's where things could get messy. Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned 6,000. We've had a few guests on the program that sort of called for the end of the blow off top at around 6,100. So right in that range. And uh, if I look at that chart, it seems like it is topping out and uh, we are reaching the end of that. And I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. Um, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah. And, and you, one thing I would love to show you guys is I want to show you guys this chart on the DIA, which is the Dow, where it's the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And I want to just take a look at this. And if we go to our monthly chart and we zoom out on the monthly here, Take a look at this kind of scary trend line. This goes back to 1899. So we're going back over 125 years. And there's a trend line that connects that high to the pre-Great Depression high, goes right to the dot-com high, the 2021 highs, and then look at where we are right here. So if I'm a technician and, and looking and, and doing probabilities of a market, I would be much more scared of a sell-off here favoring that based on historically what we've seen off of this 125-year trend line. So that's a pretty remarkable trend line. What, what stocks are leading the charge here right now? Like what stocks do you expect to, to lead the charge of 6,000 in the S&P 500 and here? Um, although there's not much room left in this chart, but uh, what, uh, what, what stocks leading the way now? 
Yeah. So I, I think when we look at this, right, we we have to look at, at names like the the trusty ones. Like if we're going to head to 6,000, NVIDIA has to be part of that. Apple has to be part of that. And I also think it's been really interesting because companies like Walmart, right? Walmart, I actually have a put position that I've accumulated here right at these highs because this stock is trading at a 40 forward PE. And if, if you, you understand the PE ratios, Historically, Walmart never trades at a 40 PE ratio. That's the same PE ratio that an NVIDIA is trading at, that Apple, that Microsoft, even, even richer than those stocks. Because what's happened is some money has been pulled out of the mega caps. We've seen the mega caps, the trillion dollar names, except for Meta not being at all time highs. Money has come out and gone into defensive names. And what we've seen again is there's, there's so much money in the mega caps that when money gets pulled out, there's just not enough places to go. So you get these overbought scenarios in something like Walmart. Uh, also, another one out there like that is, is uh, let me think about this, is Walmart. And uh, even like even like names like UAL have had an incredible run here, 48% off of the lows from August. And so so it's, it's really getting extended in so many levels. Prior to August, you probably could have said, oh, well, you know, the mega caps are the only ones participating. But now it's a lot broader in terms of the participation. Yeah, that is interesting because the Russell 2000 keeps popping up when we talk about sector rotation. And uh, maybe we can take a look at that. Like, because that's where a lot of the money is le like going into from the mega caps, as you said, to, to the small caps. So I'm curious, how, how's the Russell? How's the Russell doing? Yeah, the Russell. So the Russell's it has rallied quite nicely this year, um, but it's still well lagging a lot of these other other indices, right? So if you look at this, this was your all time high on the Russell back in 2021, and it still hasn't even come up there. I do have a key resistance that I do think we hit in the near term at around 232, you know, 50 to 65. There's a gap fill there, and then if we get through that, you should touch the all time highs. But it wouldn't be shocking to me to see that small caps before the end of this market run have to participate fully, which to me would mean the Russell has to at least touch a new all-time high. Maybe not stay there. Maybe it's a quick hit, but at least touch that all-time high. I, I always like asking you, Gareth, about volatility in the sector. Volumes as well, what, what that tells you. I'm curious, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Volatility seems extremely high, um, although it's, it's, it, the VIX has come down. Yeah, like I'm curious if that's changed. Like I haven't followed it the last few days, so I'm really curious to get an update there. Um, following the Fed rate cut, whether people gotten more nervous. Yeah, yeah. So and, and that's the kicker, right? So in August we saw this massive move up. My my VIX chart is just popping up here in just one second. But basically, what we've seen in terms of the VIX is that you had that huge pop in August, and then everyone said, "Oh, it's over." And nothing is going to occur at this point going forward, right? So meaning that that volatility died down very, very quickly. And here's the VIX chart right here. And we can see, again, that massive move up in August. But look, we're all the way back down into a range that's much more normalized. Now, historically, the VIX usually hovers between 15 and 25. We've seen a prolonged period of low volatility, except for this recent spike in August. And I would just say that the market is really in this mode and investors are in this mode of saying, hey, listen, we don't have to ever worry about any sort of long term negatives because the Fed will always bail us out. And so that's why the VIX always comes back down so fast and has been historically over the last year or two much, much lower, because the idea is that the Fed is always there to kind of cushion our fall in the stock market like they kind of did in August. Now they're cutting rates, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I do think that that's a false sense of security. And it does make me very concerned that at some point the Fed loses control. Now you might say, well, how does the Fed lose control? Well, as the US debt balloons, there will be a point where other countries and buyers of our debt say, hey, listen, if, we, if you're only paying 3% or 4% interest, we're not taking on your debt. We're not gonna buy your debt, which is funding your expenditures. Um, unless you pay us five or six percent. Now, the problem is the Fed only controls the interest rates as far as it goes until our buyers of debt say, no, 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 we demand a higher rate. Then the Fed loses control. And so granted, that's probably years away and we have to run up the debt even more, unfortunately, to get to that point. But it is something that investors should pay attention to is that the Fed is not the end all be all. They are not the gods of the economy, if you will. And of the financial system, the rest of the market and participants ultimately are the end all be all. So, so in that regard, like, what is the TLT and uh, you know telling you right now? If you look at it, because it seems like that was the one thing that sold off is bonds um, fo following the rate cut decision here. Yeah, and the, and the reason why the bonds and this is very confusing to people because we we saw rates come down, but then 
yields actually rallied higher. The 10-year yield went higher on the back of this. And the thought process is, is yields went up because it was a 50 basis point cut, and that's going to strengthen the economy, and therefore rates can, can, kind of came up. But I do think it's a short-term benefit, uh, meaning that re- yields will eventually come back down once we see more um, indicators of a weaker economy. So if we look at the 10-year yield, this is the 10-year yield. One of the things we can see here, this is what's called a wedge pattern. And the wedge pattern broke down, so we have a breakdown. And then you have a major longer-term target right here, guys. Look at this. This is an amazing trend line convergence, right around 3.25. So ultimately, I think that, again, we've had a recent bounce here, but I do think that ultimately we're going to see yields come down into this 3.2, 3.25 zone before we bottom out. Uh, so ultimately, that means more rate cuts and likely a weaker economic picture, which in the coming months, we'll see more economic data that probably reflects that. Okay, so you were saying, you're actually saying more rate cuts to get to that target level. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. That's like right. I'm trying to understand the process behind it, because we've, we've seen rate cuts and the bond yields shot up. Right, or right. Up, which, like an which again was just like a short ticket. term. It was just a short term move because people were thinking, "Oh my goodness!" Like you know, if the Fed doesn't cut fast enough, the economy is going to collapse, which was forcing rates even lower because then the Fed would have to cut rates even more. Now the idea is that hey, they cut fifty. This is going to help boost the economy. We've seen copper rally. We've seen nickel start to bounce. You know, a lot of these industrial metals, even silver. And that's, again, telling us that the perception is that the aggressive cut by the Fed is going to help the economy, and therefore the Fed may not have to cut quite as much in the future. I don't buy that for one second. I think that ultimately uh, markets or economies are going to weaken substantially, and then you'll see these yields come back down. I'm curious, like, how long will it take for, for the Fed rate cut to actually trickle down into the real economy? Right. Yeah. I mean, like, that's something I'm wondering about. Like, when will it be reflected? I actually just went on Trading Economics website I use quite a bit, and uh, the, their headline news is mortgage application search for the second week. So I'm sure home home um, home builders will will see an uptick here. I'm curious what kind of sectors are leading the way right now. Yeah. So you mentioned the home builders; they're seeing a little bit of a reprieve. Although KBH just reported earnings yesterday, and that stock is actually down today. Although again, going into it, it was at all time highs, but you can see mm-hmm. down about five percent today on the back of their earnings. And I think the key is that you know when you see interest rates come down just a little bit, there's always a certain amount of home buyers that have been kind of sitting on the sidelines, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting for those rates to just come down, and then they're kind of scared that rates are going to go back up, so they jump on that little bit of a lower. A rate number and buy a house house or get a mortgage. Um, my thought process is, though, that'll be exhausted very quickly. Um, again, especially if the economy gets worse, you're going to have more and more people losing jobs, and that is not good for the housing market. So I actually think that the housing stocks eventually go even lower here. And I do think that, again, that's not a place that you want to be, even if rates are coming in. Because if rates are coming in, it means the economy is doing much, much worse. Verse, and this is the kicker, during COVID and right after COVID, people had more money than ever because the government was sending checks. Rates were at basically zero. And so it really made people buy homes. But now you have a different scenario. If rates are coming down, it's not because the economy is going to be strong, but because the economy is weak and that's going to cancel out. So you'll have some people buying homes, but other people losing jobs and unable to buy homes uh, going forward. Yeah, interesting commentary there. I'm really, really curious how it all plays out. And uh, I think it depends on really, like, we put way too much emphasis on the words that uh, Jerome Powell utters in the press conference, right? Because uh, I'm, I'm trying to look at like at the TLT, what could be a trend reversal is Powell saying, well, we're not going to cut rates for the next six months here and wait for, for things to play out, right? Yeah. I think that would really shock the market because the data is telling us something completely different. Um, Gareth, b- before hitting the record button, we talked about the US dollar and uh, I'm really curious what your thoughts are, Dixie in particular, because I told you beforehand, just my very, very amateurish trading knowledge would tell me that uh, gold, uh, sorry, uh, the US dollar wants to break down. It wants to hit 95, maybe even 90 at some point. Yep, yep. And you'd be correct, at least according to my analysis. So what we can see again, just like with the 10 year yield, we have this wedge pattern and you can see how it bounced, bounced, bounced and then bounced and then finally broke down. So you've already begun the process of a breakdown here on the de- the dollar and the dollar now trading at around 101, just below 101. Um, what we're forming here is what we call a bearish flag pattern. So it's sideways chop after a sharp move. And ultimately this pattern yields further downside. Um, I do have a longer term target. Take a look at this trend line here going back to 2011, connecting the lows here and the lows from 2021 during COVID. 
And that brings us to just about what you were saying, right around 95 to 96. And so I do think that's where it's headed. I don't know what time frame, though. That's always the toughest thing is like, you know, what's the time frame where we get into that level? My guess is, though, within 12 months, if not sooner, we'll be down to 96, 95 you to talk about gold because i'm really curious if we break down or if the if the dixie breaks down what will that do to gold like what's the correlation these days because it's nothing certain anymore these days it seems like how, how much steam is left in the gold train oh uh, yeah so to so if you're looking mid to long term there's a massive amount of upside still in gold and i know i know you know i've been i think the last time we talked it was at 2100 so we've already come quite a bit higher than that but one of the things i do want to mention so there's a difference in time frames right if you're looking mid to long term i remain very very bullish we just hit though my next target price which was 2600 i want to show you how i came up with that price so what i do is i flip to the logarithmic chart on trading view here and what i did was I said, okay, well, what if we zoom out and we go back to our previous bull market cycles? And so if we do that, we see that in 1980, we had this high. We connected to the high from 2011, the bull market high there. But look at what we just tagged here, that same trend line. So based on technical analysis, this tells me in the very short term, you might get some sort of retrace in gold, which almost makes a lot of sense because in all fairness, I think you mentioned this before we started recording as well, is that a, there's so much hype out there. So, so many people are jumping on the bandwagon of gold. And one of the things I've learned in trading is that when everyone jumps on, it usually has to shake those weak hands out. The hardcore people like us, we're going to be riding this even after a pullback. But there's a lot of weaker hands that think, oh, this is easy money. They need to get whipped out first. So in the very short term, I'm looking for a pullback to 2,500. And then the next leg to 3,000 should begin at that point in time. I was going to say, like, are there gaps that need to be closed for, for yeah. a healthy move up? Because I, I, I told you beforehand, the move has been so violent in a positive sense. Yeah. Like, just just look at it. Beginning of the year, we were at pretty much $2,000. Now we're at twenty six. For For a 5,000-year-old relic, it's a monster move. A monster move, a monster move, right? So, so if we look here, I mean, this would be this would be a crazy pullback. I don't think that's what we're going to get. But I will show you if we go back to the daily chart. There's this little what we would call a shelf right over here where price of gold kept on hammering and hammering, hammering. Look at right here, here, along here, and then over here, and then finally broke out. And so there's a tendency in charting where once you break out from these levels, you get that big push up like we've seen, but at some point it comes back in to retest it. I call it the scene of the crime retrace. Once it does that, then it can make its next move to the upside. So essentially what this, this would almost make a lot of sense, right? Imagine all those people that are buying gold up here, if they flush down gold to let's say a pierce of 2,500, if it were to just go a fraction below 2,500, a lot of those people will get scared, exit their positions, and then the bull move can start up again. So I'm kind of looking for a pullback off this 2,660 level back to 2,500, and then that next leg towards 3,000 should begin. But I think you're right on this when you talked about the dollar, right? The dollar ultimately to me looks like it's going lower, which means your mid to long-term view of gold, just it's, it's going to go higher. Did you have a mid to long term target for us, Gareth? Bit a bit, bit of a cheeky question here, of course. Yeah. So so there's a couple. So so we we know that the three thousand even number is probably the next big number. It's an even number. These huge even numbers get a lot of notoriety. Price likes to get drawn to them. Um, I will say that there is a, a kind of a crazy technique that I was I was doing to try to figure out where the ultimate upside on gold would be, and I'll show you guys this real quick. And this is listen the accuracy of this to a dollar, not even close. But it's still very, very fascinating. So if we take a look at the 1970s run on gold, what do we see? Well, we saw from the low here in 76 to the high here, it was about, oh, it was about, you know, what was that? About 800% move. And then if we take the low from the, the 2001 lows to the highs of 2011, it's about a 650% percent move. Now, if you average those two out, it's about a 725% uh, percent move. So if we talk about this was a bull market, this was a bull market. If we just replicate that type of move, and I got to really go and, and, and drag this out from the lows in 2016, you're talking about a 700%, let's just say 700% move on gold. And that would bring us all the way up to about 8,500. So again, listen, 
that's that's for us that are bulls that's like a dream right i mean if we all dream about it maybe it'll happen i'm just i'm just using that one simple tool of saying saying what's the average run in every bull market since 1970s and that that would give us an eighty five hundred dollar price target now if you go back to saying well what causes us to go there well we have a lot of factors right you have global instability that's just getting worse you have the u.s national debt which is just keep going up and all these central banks just continuing to lower rates and print money so there's a lot of reasons why it could do that but again that's kind of the pipe dream if it could get there that would be awesome <laughs> price target bulls dream off is going to be my youtube title so i appreciate that um no thanks for the layup there no i appreciate that that's really interesting because <laughs> you've been spot on in the first part and uh i don't see why you don't see three thousand dollars quite honestly i've been to saying that before like we've laughed we've all laughed about it but i've heard that price target from let's, let's call them official sources meaning back analysts quite often now and uh not not saying that it's going to become true because we all wish for it but if we would have said that 12 months ago we would have all been laughed out of the room quite honestly that's true so. I, I still remember and i'll just go on on record and say this at the beginning of the year and, and we talked when it was 2100 but at the beginning of the year it was below 2100 and i and my year and target was 2530 as as you know um, and you have no idea the comments I got. Oh, gold's done. You're, you're ridiculous. Da, 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 da. And then here we are well above 26, 25, 30. So, so you're right. People do, you know, you make these predictions, people laugh at you, but sometimes <laughs> proof's in the pudding, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No, I'm glad we're proven right once in a while, you know, so, right. I pre so I appreciate that. Um, l l let's, let's move on. So Gareth, we could, we've extensively covered gold now. L let's talk about this, the little brother. Let's talk silver. And uh, I want to ask you to throw copper into the mix because I've been catching a lot of flack in the comments and uh, on other channels as well that have been saying silver is an industrial metal, or at least it's behaving like one when you look at the charts. And uh, Prove my point. To prove, prove me right, Gareth, because I'm really curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, and so you're you're 100 right. Is that that at this stage, it's now gold in a league of its own, and silver is behaving much more like copper as an industrial metal. And no better example of this than just yesterday. This is the chart of copper. Look at this massive green candle right here. And then if we flip over to silver, we can see right here. Look at this big green candle on silver yesterday as well. And again. Think about what caused this. Why did copper rally? Well, it was because the Chinese introduced massive stimulus measures. And that, again, is an industrial factor, a strengthening of the economy that should, in theory, boost demand for industrial metals. And therefore, again, copper rallied. And now we see silver rally as well. Do, do you see a trigger? That's more of a theoretical question, by the way. Do you see a trigger for silver to eventually decouple from the base metals? And I really hope it does, because that would mean unlimited torque for, for the precious metal. So I'm curious if you have any, an, an inkling <laughs> of what that could be. No, I, I do think I do think eventually it will, right? So right now there's this, this kind of like everyone's infatuated with gold, Bitcoin to some extent as well. But I do think that at some point silver becomes the next one to go and at that point i do think you see a lot of upside in silver the question is at what point do we have to get into a recession and then there's still demand for silver and people start seeing that again where it's like okay well people still want to have silver in their homes as a safety asset versus just the industrial side but i do think that again like you said as of now people have to just accept that until it changes this is more of an industrial metal and it's behaving just like that yeah, no, I I do agree. It, like, it, it proves my point, but I'm not saying it's not a precious metal. It just mm -hmm. behaves like one right now. And once that changes, once that once that switch gets flicked, silver's off to the races. We'll perform and, gold three to one. And, and I also think it's important to remember that the silver market per market cap is not huge, so it can be manipulated. There can be other factors involved there as well. But then, likely, you will see like once it breaks key levels, whether that's thirty two dollars and fifty cents you will see bigger short squeezes in that market where people start to chase it. And because it's a smaller market cap market, the moves will be much, much bigger. And we've seen that in the past as well when, when silver's gone on crazy runs. Uh, same same question for silver, of course, as well, Gareth. Do you have price target in mind? It seems like we've, we've got a little way to go and 32.50 seems to be that line that we need to break through. Yeah, so for me at least, I mean, I think that the main price target here you have to start looking at. So, I mean, just in the short term, 3250, right? If we break through 3250, there's this pivot from 2012, which is around 35. That would be your next level. And then following that, around 37 and change. But for me at least, when I zoom out, the obvious one here is this level up here. You have your 1980 high connected right across here. 
And then this high right here from, I think that was 2011. So, you know, at some point, I think even maybe when we break 35, you might see one of those squeezes to the upside that take us up to this 48 to $50 level. Once we get there, that's the trickier thing because it would be in un unexposed territory if it gets above $50 where it's never been before. So then we would have to go into kind of these gold analysis points uh, where it's in at all time highs and we'd have to evaluate it there. Now, are, you, are you trading silver right now? I do. I do. I do trade silver. Um, I've been a little bit more cautious than than on silver because of its industrial side, like you've been mentioning. So it's not as pure play as, hey, just go long gold because with the printing of money, et cetera, it's going to go up. You have to be a little bit more nimble because if we did get an economic report here in the U.S. that was very, very weak, silver would dump out while gold would likely hold up. And so so I do trade it, but I'm just a little bit more careful about my entries and exits. No, fantastic. I you know, appreciate your opinion there. Um, last chart I want to talk about, you had it up already, is copper, of course. Um, you know, with the China stimulus package, question is how much also does the copper chart have left to give here? And uh, I've already seen calls for more stimulus in, in China as well. It's not enough to, to stimulate the consumer, to keep the consumer spending. Um, curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, so so for copper, I have upside to about four dollars and seventy cents, four dollars and sixty seven cents. Um, to me, that's where I will start to look to short it myself. And again, keep in mind, I mean, if if someone has a much more bullish view of the global and domestic economy, then you might have a much higher price target. But I continue to see. Uh, a Chinese economy that sure they're doing these stimulus measures, but so far it hasn't worked, right? They've been mired in a, a recession essentially since the beginning of COVID. And then you flip over to the U S and that we see the labor market weakening. We see the revisions in jobs coming out like 800,000 or less jobs were created last year than had been stated. I mean, these crazy numbers and even unemployment starting to creep up. And so for me, at least I see that as a continual path to a recession and where copper eventually becomes a short here and probably heads back down uh, due to industrial pressure. So, so again, for me, I'm not short copper right now, but if it got up to this 467, I would probably start taking a short position. No, fantastic. I really appreciate you you clarifying that and we'll see where we're headed. Uh, really curious, because like, recession fears are still looming, yet copper is rallying. So I'm just yeah. wondering if it's just a storm in the water glass or if there's more behind it. Right? Yeah, and I, th I think that's what it is right now, is you have this narrative being spun that the Fed has just cured all the ills of the market with their 50 basis point cut. I don't buy that for a second, but that's what the narrative is. So that's why we've seen an uptick in copper. Then you throw in the China news, it, it actually pushed it up even more. But I do think those things fade and really the US will be even the more dominant force here in copper's performance in the future. Future. No, fantastic. Gareth, I ambushed you last time with one last question, and it is what's your favorite chart out there right now? Let's see. Um, <laughs> I know it's an unfair one because it's one you can't prepare really for. So I'm curious, what, what's your favorite chart out there? doesn't matter what sector, what stock it is, or okay. uh, index. Just curious, what, what's your All favorite right. one? I'm going to give you guys this one right here, right? So this is a semiconductor, but it's not the AI chips. They These are for EV vehicles as well as, um, you know, basically battery backups. This stock is trading at 1995 levels at a billion dollar valuation. It is again, here's your here's your trend line back here. Let me get rid of that line. From 1995, this is the level back here. They have 2 billion in cash. The market caps only 1 billion dollars. Um, and they're ramping up production of these chips that are much more efficient than anything on the market. So it's my sleeper call <laughs> here. I do have a, a position in it myself, so I just want to be honest and open with that. But I do like it for a, a 1x, a 2x, maybe 3x type move to the upside. No, fantastic. Awesome. We'll, we'll track that. And just out of curiosity, I always find it interesting because you track such a wild field and you track pretty much anything anyway. So I'm curious, you got to have a favorite, you know, yeah. one that comes to mind when I asked that question. It's, and it was that one. Gareth, a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate your insights, of course. Thanks so much for your time. I know you're extremely busy running your YouTube channel and uh, your courses. You, I, I'm not sure how you find any time for to do for doing these interviews anyway. So really appreciative. Um, no, I appreciate, just, oh, I appreciate it. Oh, you just froze for a second here. Okay. Uh, I was back. worried. <laughs> yeah, I know. But but I just want to say thank you for having me on. And, and I know it was like eight months ago. So let's make sure that, that sooner next time that I'm back with you and we can we can dive right into these commodities again. Fantastic. Where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? Uh, verifiedinvesting.com, folks. It's a, it's a website that has so much free data-driven analysis on commodities, on crypto, on stocks. It's all there for you guys. There's, again, a, just a plethora of information, education on there. So come check out verifiedinvesting.com. Phenomenal. Gareth, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And to uh, everybody else, thanks so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially. It's always great to have a reality check. Where are things headed? What what do news mean? Like, what, how are they impacting the charts and prices? And to... Uh, 
where, where are things headed and how much room is left to go in either direction. Always great to have Gareth on. If you did like the content, we would highly appreciate a subscription. Leave a, leave a comment, follow, like, hit that bell icon. It is appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you. Thank you.